Okay. Hello, yes, okay. I'm Al Swigert. Uh, hi. How's everyone doing? That's great, yeah. Um, so I've been programming in Python for a number of years now. Uh, I really like programming. Um, I really like the attention to detail that programming requires for, for, uh, from you. Uh, in fact, I like it so much that I wrote a book about programming. It's called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. Um, it's released under a Creative Commons license, so you can go online and read the full book uh, at automatetheboringstuff.com. And one of the benefits of doing this was that I can look at the uh, web analytics and see where all the traffic's going, and a lot of people seem to really like the web scraping and GUI automation chapters, so that's what I decided to make this talk about. I'm gonna be talking about uh, Selenium and also another module called Pi Auto GUI. So, um, wow, web scraping. This is a huge topic. Um, pretty much a lot of the stuff that we do on the computer is really stuff that we do on the web. Like if you've ever been in one of those terrifying situations where you don't have Wi-Fi and you just kind of like instinctively open your web browser and then realize, oh, that's right, and so you close your web browser and then you open your web browser again to check Twitter and say, oh, right, I don't have internet. The internet is a big part of, of what we do uh, on our computers. And so it's really great if we can write software that can interact with websites uh, and pull content off of that. But unfortunately, that requires knowing a lot about networking protocols and HTTP and how to handle errors. And so I have, I've, but I've listed all those details on this next slide. Oh, well, okay, anyway. Forget about that. You actually don't have to know about any of those details because there is a, a tool called Selenium. Um, and you can have it on Python just by running pip install selenium or selenium, selenium, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, and this is a module that will actually launch a web browser that you can control programmatically from your Python script. So you can tell it where to go. And so this way, this web browser can handle all the web browser stuff that automatically happens. Like it can run JavaScript and you can uh, easily log into things. You don't have to know about get and post and uh, cookies and setting all of that other low level networking stuff. Selenium will do a lot of this for you uh, automatically. And so this is kind of what Selenium looks like. When I first heard about this tool, it was something that the QA department was using. They were like creating this automated test suite for the web app and it sounded really complicated. So I sort of just put off learning about it. But actually it, it I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, uh, you can learn all the basics and then start using it. Um, and that's about 90% of, of what you need. So I fit it all onto this one slide. Um, there's a few tiny little warts about it. One of them is you have to run like from Selenium import web driver. You can't just have import Selenium. And there's a few other warts that I'll be going over as well. Um, but yeah, this, you just import it. Uh, you can run webdriver.firefox or webdriver.chrome. Uh, you can set up different browsers to run. And this will actually launch a web browser that appears on your desktop. Uh, and your script can then control it. it. You just have this browser object that it returns. You can direct it to a website. Uh, you can find some sort of HTML element that's on that web page by passing it a CSS selector. And this is really complicated, but there's a cheat that I'll go into in a little bit. Um, but yeah, once you have that element, just you know, a paragraph tag or a text field or a checkbox or a button, you can then read what text it has. So you can read what the text on the web page is. If it's a checkbox or a button, you can click on it. And then you can just uh, quit from the browser and that'll just shut everything down for you. So uh, this is a lot of telling and not showing. So I'm going to do something that is highly ill-advised and that is I'm going to do a live demo of this code. So I am breaking out of PowerPoint right now. Um, oh, not quite yet. Gonna go to this next slide. So this is that uh, CSS selector stuff. Uh, I'm gonna show you exactly how you can use uh, Selenium. So I'm just gonna run idle. Oh man, everything can go wrong. Like Wi-Fi could cut out anything. It'll just be an awkward mess, but let's see if I've appeased the gods and this will work. So from Selenium import, web driver, uh, you want to get your browser object. I have Chrome and you can see, boom, just this web browser just automatically pops up. And you can do something like, I don't know, just go to, uh, because I want to plug my book again, uh, automate the boring stuff. 
Com. No syntax errors. That's great. And so now you can programmatically control this web browser to do whatever you want. Now there is that next step where you want to you want to grab an element on this web page, and you need to figure out the really complex CSS selector. And maybe you know CSS and all about selectors. Uh, maybe you don't. All web all modern web browsers have a nice little feature where you can just right click on some element. Like say I want this link uh, to the Creative Commons license. I can just select inspect, and this will bring up the developer tools. For, uh, for this web page. And all browsers have some sort of developer tools. Usually you just hit F12 to bring it up. It's really handy if you're uh, ever doing like some sort of like non-Python language like JavaScript and you have to debug stuff. Um, but yeah, we can just go through here and oh, okay, there's that link. I'm just gonna right click on it. In Chrome, it's uh, like copy selector. In other uh, browsers, it might be copy CSS path or copy CSS selector or something like that. That's that really complicated a uh, bit of text right here. And so this is the CSS selector for that one link. And I'm going to, what was that? Um, Browser.find element by CSS selector. That's a huge mouthful. It's another like, OK, if I was in charge of Selenium, I would have given that a shorter name. But hey, it works. Um, and then get this uh, web element object. Oh, messed up this live demo. Let me just save that to a variable. That'll be much more useful. So this is the web element object that represents that link. And then you can just say, well, what's the text in that link? Oh, it's Creative Commons license. So you can see that right here. And then if you just wanted to click on that, you can just call click. And then it'll just follow that link. So now you're controlling the browser from your Python script. So you can imagine all sorts of cases where you have a web app and you want to write all these automated tests. Make sure that some text appears after you click on this thing. Um, and it's really simple. This, I mean, what? I'm 10 minutes into my uh, presentation. And that's about 80% of all the things that you need to know about Selenium to get started. OK, let me go back to the safety of the PowerPoint presentation away from the live demo. Oh, yeah, and of course I go to the wrong slide. So that, that uh, method was find element by CSS selector, which is quite a mouthful. There's also a few other ones like find element by, I think, ID or by tag name or by link text. 80% uh, of the time you're going to be using uh, by CSS selector. There's also find elements, plural, which will return an entire list of these element objects. So if you just wanted to specify something much more broad, um, maybe go through like all the links. <coughs> uh, you can use that. So next, um, you can see I called that click method just to click on it. If you have a, a text field element that you've grabbed and you want to fill out the text field, uh, you can just uh, call this send keys method and pass it a string, and it'll just automatically type it in. If the uh, element that you've grabbed is part of a form, you can submit the form by calling submit. Um, if, you have, uh, if you just want to press random keys that you can't really type into a string, like the escape key or the down arrow key, there's a, a whole bunch of constants in Selen that Selenium provides. This is just a random table. Um, you don't have to memorize all of this right now. But you can find all this information. Uh, unfortunately, it's in this module called selenium.webdriver.common.keys. Um, which is, is kind of a convoluted thing. So if you've ever read the Zen of Python, one of the things is flat is better than nested. And this is kind of an example of something you don't want to do. It'd be much nicer for your users if you just have from Selenium import keys. Um, you, know, you don't have to deal with that huge arbitrary category hierarchy thing. Um, but yeah. Uh, so that's all about uh, clicking on things inside the web page. But you can also control the web browser itself in Selenium. So you can probably figure out what all of these methods do. If you want to click on the back button or click on the forward or refresh buttons, it's a really just really straightforward. And then reading uh, all of the data off of the web page itself, it's just dot text. Whatever element you're looking at, uh, you can just get dot text. That returns a string. Uh, if you want to look at the HTML in this element, say you have a link element, and you want to see where that link goes, and so you want to look at what the href value is. You can just call get attribute and pass it href. Um, another weird wart, uh, you might think that if you wanted to get a list of all the attributes for that, uh, for that link or for that element, you'd just call get attributes. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, this doesn't exist 
And there's sort of a weird workaround where you can get the outer HTML attribute, and that'll return all of the content and everything as a string, and you can try to parse that maybe. Um, but I mean, so this works. Uh, it'd be great if get attributes was added one day to this. But it is possible to get a list of all of the um, all of the attributes for some element that you have. So that is uh, Selenium. You can just autom uh, what I'm. I have no idea. Let me break out. Uh, Eleven minutes into this presentation, and I've already covered basically all you need to know to start writing automated tests for your web app. It's that simple. Um, but let's say you're, uh, apparently there are, web app, there are apps that aren't web apps these days. Who knew? Um, and using Selenium won't work for that. You need to control stuff that's outside the browser. So there's a much more broader tool um, that does GUI automation. And this is a very fancy word that, or term that just means writing programs that can control the mouse and keyboard on your computer. So if you have some desktop application and you want to automatically uh, check, you know, is, I want to click on this menu and then click on this submenu item and make sure all these things appear. Uh, you can just directly do that in automated fashion by controlling the mouse and keyboard directly. Um, and so the tool that I'm using for this is uh, one that I wrote actually called Pi Auto GUI. Uh, it, I, I basically wrote this because there was a lot of, of existing uh, GUI automation modules for Python, but none of them were for Python 2 and 3 and some of them were just for Windows or just for Mac. So I wanted something that worked on every single, um, on every single major operating system out there. And also I wanted something with a really simple API. So I kind of just did a lot of copying and pasting and a bunch of testing and came up with Pi Auto GUI. And you can, there's a documentation that is mostly up to date at readthedocs.org. And so I tried to make this a really easy like straightforward tool to, uh, to use. So here's all the functions for, for controlling the mouse. I mean, if you want to click the mouse wherever it is, you can just call pyautogui.click. Uh, if you wanted to click somewhere on the screen, you can just pass x, y coordinates there. And it has things for double click and right click. The, the click function itself has all sorts of keyword arguments to do fancy sorts of clicking. Um, but these are all just the basics. And you know, 99% of the time, that'll be enough uh, that you need. If you want to move to the mouse to some x, y coordinates on the screen, you have move to. That'll move it instantly over uh, to the screen. Or, or you can have it just gradually move uh, to the final destination by just specifying some duration that it'll take like three seconds to move there. Or if you just wanted to move it you know, 10 pixels over to the left, there's move rel to move it relative to where it already is. And then there's drag to and drag rel. Uh, for holding the mouse button down while dragging this. And then uh, if you wanted to get where the mouse uh, pointer is currently, there's position. If you want to get the resolution of the screen, there's size. And then there's this tiny uh, function that's kind of like a sort of mini program inside this module called display mouse position, which I will now go back into the dreaded live demo and see if this actually works. OK, so import Pi Auto GUI. Uh, display mouse position is really handy if you're planning out what you want to click on because by running this, it will give you a position. It'll give you this real-time updated position of where the mouse is. So you can see 0, 0 at the very top of the corner of the screen is up there, and you can move it around. It'll also give you the uh, red, green, blue color value of whatever pixel is directly underneath the mouse. So if you, know, if you have like a checkbox here, and a checkbox here, and a checkbox here, you can just sort of move the mouse over there and just write down all these coordinates and plug those into your, uh, into your script or test later. And I can hit Control-C to stop it. Yes. Controlling the keyboard is a lot simpler because there's just fewer things to do. The main function here is just typewrite. So pi auto GUI typewrite, uh, pass it a string. It will just send those keystrokes to whatever application has focus. Um, or if you want to have uh, just press some other key that you can't easily type into a string, like page up. You want to press the page up button, you can call the press function. And there's a whole list of these uh, strings for various keyboard keys in uh, pi auto GUI dot keyboard underscore keys. <coughs> 
And then finally, if you want to do like some uh, shortcut or hotkey, like control O to open, uh, you can just call the hotkey function. I'm going to go back into live demo mode. Hopefully this will work. Okay, so here's idle. Like most applications, you can hit control O to open up a file. Please work, please work, please work, please work, please work, please work, please work. Hot key, control, O, and then this simulates doing uh, control O. I'll, I'll keep my hands up so that you can see that I'm not pressing control O, it just opens it automatically by itself. Ooh. Yes, I, I can press control O, this is fascinating. Yeah, I can just keep doing this all the time. Very impressive. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, let's go into some a more substantive uh, live demo. I'm just going to exit out of here. And now I will do, not only will I do a live demo, I will do a live demo that depends on Microsoft Paint. <laughs> yes, remember this tool? Ah, yeah, just drawing things all over. Okay, so this is just a basic graphics tool. Uh, you can just draw simple pictures on it. There is no API for Microsoft Paint. You know, I guess Microsoft didn't imagine that this is you know, a great, powerful tool that everybody would want to have a programmatic interface to, so they didn't include that. But now, with PyAuto GUI, we can have this. Um, let me find this file, which hopefully still exists. Yes, it does. Okay, so. Here's a small little script I made that has a uh, PyAuto GUI. You can see all it does is it'll give me a five second pause just so I can position everything and just click on the MS Paint program. And then it'll just start using drag rel to drag the mouse relative to its current position. Just move it right and move it down and move it left and then move it up. So it'll just draw this sort of spiral pattern because the distance will be decreasing after a while. So let me just, uh, let me, okay, I'm gonna press F5 to run this. I'll hold my hands up so that you can see I am not drawing this myself. So F5, okay, I have five seconds. Put that there, hopefully this will work. <gasps> Ooh. <laughs> so I mean, you might, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so you might think, well, okay, I mean, there's Pillow and there's all these other image uh, modules, so you could create images from your own application. But you know, notice uh, MS Paint has this nice, nice nifty little brush tool, and so it's more than just drawing lines. You can make use of the tools that MS Paint provides uh, to create images automatically. And also, you can do it much more precisely too. Like if I tried to draw this shape uh, myself, you can see it is not nearly uh, as well done. So this is the power of doing uh, GUI automation and being able to control the mouse and keyboard and thus then therefore just basically being able to control any application that's on your computer. But there is sort of a downside that I wanted to warn you about. Um, there's that movie Fantasia and a scene in it called The Sorcerer's Apprentice. This is the one with Mickey Mouse dressed as a wizard and he enchants these brooms to just go through and, oh yeah, of course this is gonna come up. Um, no. So he enchants these brooms to get buckets of water and fill up a bath um, over and over again. Except, you know, these are just mindlessly programmed to continuously fill up this bath water, even as the water starts overflowing and Mickey can't stop it, and instead it just starts filling up the entire uh, building. Um, same thing with, uh, with Pi Auto GUI and GUI automation. Because your script is controlling the mouse and keyboard, if you want to stop that script, you might not be able to move the mouse over to close that window and end up just having to, I don't know, pull the battery out of your laptop or, or something like that. <laughs> so PyAuto GUI does have some uh, fail-safe uh, mechanisms in it. Uh, the main one is that if you ever move the mouse to the top left corner where X uh, is zero and Y is zero, um, every, every PyAuto GUI function will be checking for this at the end of, its, uh, of the code that it runs. And if it sees that the mouse is up there, then it'll automatically, hello again. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just keep that and don't show that. So helpful. Uh, you can move, so you can move the mouse cursor up to the top left corner. And 
it automatically kill the, the program by just raising this fail safe exception. Every single PyAuto GUI function has a 10th second delay, uh, so it just gives you a little bit of time to uh, toss this. And you can change pyautogui.pause to be a larger number if you want a larger delay. So I'm going to go back to live demo mode. Let's run this program again, except let's say that it's going out of control. Um, let's say this number is, is completely wrong, or I just have, ooh, so a live demo with an infinite loop. I really hope this works. Um, OK, so I'm going to run this. And then it will be constantly drawing this. And I can't stop it because it's moving the mouse. So I just have to slam the mouse up to the corner. Did this actually work? Hey, I think it did. Yes, so it just raises this fail safe exception. And that'll halt your program. And so you want something like that, no matter what GUI automation tool you're using. Um, unfortunately, there's no like global hotkey support yet in, in PyAuto GUI. So you can't just hit like control P or something like that uh, to stop it. But there is, there is some sort of mechanism where you can stop the program from running. Um, the other downside for GUI automation tools is that you can pass it uh, x, y coordinates and say, just click here. And it really won't know what it's clicking on. It's just, you know, it'll just blindly click on whatever. So uh, it, hopefully, your window is set up correctly, and there's a button that you want to click on, and it's in the right place. But if not, then your program can just start clicking on random stuff and continue running like a mindless uh, broom from that Disney cartoon. So PyAuto GUI also has some limited image recognition uh, facilities. One is just the pixel function, which uh, just returns the RGB value of some x of the pixel at some x y coordinate. So if you're expecting to click on a gray submit button, then you can check. Okay, is this actually gray where the pixel is? Um, but a little bit more. Um, Sophisticated than that is uh, you can also use screenshots and find images on the screen. This is because PyAuto GUI relies on Pillow to do this. If you're on Linux, uh, you'll have to install this one tool, uh, Scrot, which does screenshots. But you have this one function here, locate on screen, that will locate uh, where some image, uh, where, where some, something on the screen is. I'll show you with another live demo. So. <laughs> Let's just bring out all of the Windows applications. Here's the calculator app that comes with Windows. And I've created an image that, uh, of the 7 key. So let me actually just find this. Yeah, 7 key.png. This is just a regular image, just like that. And I can say, I can ask PyAuto GUI, like, look on the entire screen, take a screenshot, and then find out where this image is. And if you find it, Give me the coordinates for where it is. So let me just run this. OK, Pi Auto GUI, locate on screen. Hopefully, my working directory is set up. And then run this. And then it returns a, a rectangle, basically. Here's the xy coordinate for the top corner. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and here's, here's the width, and here's the height of that area on the screen where it found that 7 key. Um, there's also uh, locate center on screen. And notice this function was kind of long. It took like half a second. It could take upwards of to a, up to a second to actually run. So if you're trying to do something in real time where you need to have it locate it you know, 100 times a second, this is probably not the function for you. But if you look in the documentation, there are several ways that you can make it faster just by searching a subset of the entire screen or um, uh, a few other options that you can look at. Uh, another function there is locate center on screen if you just want the x, y coordinate for where the middle of this rectangle is. So you can see I'll just copy and paste this and then have uh, Pi Auto GUI just click on that 7. And you can see the mouse instantly moves over there to click on the 7. We can even have something like put this inside of a loop and just have it click on that 7 over and over and over again. So that's a way that you can have some, I mean, it is sort of you need a pixel perfect uh, copy of what you're looking for. If you have OpenCV also installed, then PyAuto GUI can use that to get uh, kind of like a fuzzy match. So it doesn't have to be exactly uh, what you're looking for. So, but 
uh, just plain vanilla Pi Auto GUI, you know, if there's a slightly, if there's just one pixel that's off by a, a little bit, then it's not going to find it. You notice right here the seven key helpfully highlights if the mouse is over it, so that'll totally throw Pi Auto GUI off. Uh, but you do have something where you know you can at least find out where things are on the image or on the screen. Let me go back to this. All right, so what is GUI automation used for? I should have probably put this slide at the top of, of the talk. But uh, you can see, well, we can automatically test uh, desktop apps, things that aren't web apps that don't run in a browser. Selenium is great for testing things that are in a browser. That's what you want to use. Uh, GUI automation is sort of something that you want to use as a last ditch effort if there's no API or no other way to do it. Um, but you can also use it to, you can also use GUI automation to test uh, non-HTML stuff in a web app. So say you have a flash animation and you need to click on buttons inside that flash animation. There's no HTML tag for, for those buttons inside the flash animation. Or in, there's no HTML for stuff inside of a HTML5 canvas. Um, so it's great for just being able to click inside of things like that. But the number one thing that you can use GUI automation for is to cheat at flash games. <laughs> so this is the final live demo. The uh, most ambitious one of them all. So there's a flash game called uh, Sushi Go Round. This is sort of a dine and dash game. Uh, you have customers coming in, they're ordering sushi, and then you have to click on the sushi ingredients, but you also have to make sure you have enough ingredients, and uh, there's new customers coming in, and you have to clear the plates, and all these really complicated things. And you know, you could spend time getting better at this game, or you could write a program that plays the game for you and then stops and lets you type in your name when you get the top score uh, for this. So, okay, final live demo. Hopefully this is going to work. Uh, this is something I have on my GitHub repo, Sushi Go Round Bot. All right, hopefully this is going to work. It's gonna take control of the mouse and keyboard, so I will have no uh, control over what it does next, but let's try this. Okay, here we go. It finds out where the window is on the screen, and then it starts uh, ordering sushi for people. So I can just, I think I'll just take a nap for like the next five minutes of this talk and let it do its thing. But you can see, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, there were, it doesn't play this game perfectly, of course. Uh, there were a lot of issues I, I discovered while creating this, um, and it sometimes gets confused. Uh, but for the most part, this can just play through the entire game and get a pretty decent high score. Uh, what is worrying is that there are plenty of human players who can get a higher score than this bot, which means they've spent a lot of time getting good at this game or they're just better at programming GUI automation bots to play it. Um, yeah, okay, so and whenever I wanna stop this, I'll just have to slam the mouse cursor to the top left corner. Hopefully this works. Okay, yes, and then that raises the fail safe exception. So, cheating at flash games. Yes, that's this entire talk. Uh, you can download these slides from bit.ly slash automate talk. Uh, again, the module names are Selenium, 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 however you want to pronounce it, and Pi Auto GUI. Uh, you, these are also covered in my book, which you can read online at automatetheboringstuff.com, and here's my contact information. Uh, thank you very much for, for attending this talk. Whew. Um, yeah, I guess we have uh, time for questions as well. So um, I don't know what the process is. I just line up at the mics. Hello. Have you tried mixing Selenium and PyAuto GUI to open a browser with Selenium and then click it with PyAuto GUI? <laughs> I have, and it's surprising. Uh, what happens is that a dark portal appears and opens, <laughs> unleashing all sorts of foul. I mean, theoretically, I guess this is possible. You could do that. Um, uh, Selenium is really nice because it usually blocks uh, on any function calls you make. So if you click on a link, it'll usually block and only return after the browser is done loading that new page that it's been linked to. So being able to get all of the things working nicely together is entirely possible. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the main downside of GUI automation is that it's kind of really brittle. It's easy to have your program just start clicking on random things and then, you know, say 
a dialogue window appears in the middle of your presentation or some other unexpected thing happens, it can totally throw off uh, your automated script. Uh, but yeah, you can totally use them both at the same time. Uh, if that's what you're, if you have like a web app that also has flash animations that do other things. Um, but yeah, any other questions? Uh, you mentioned that uh, to locate the cursor uh, with the image, uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. do fuzzy find yet. Um, but f for example, if your mm -hmm. Windows plug into uh, your uh, screen resolution changes, uh, do, uh, would that still work? So if your screen resolution changes, it will still work um, because it's the same pixels. And, you know, unless your app is resizing everything else for different resolutions. Um, but yeah, if you have any sort of like zoom in or zoom out uh, or magnification that's happening, then it'll, it won't work for that. Um, there, so you can it can also detect if OpenCV, the Open Computer Vision module for Python is installed. And in that case, it'll start using that to do this uh, matching. And for that, you can specify some sort of threshold, like instead of like a perfect match, you can specify 0 0.8. Uh, and that way, if you know, a few pixels are off, then it'll still be able to find it on the screen. Um, but yeah, just if you just install PyAuto GUI uh, by itself, it'll, it'll have to rely on having a pixel perfect match each time. OK, All right. thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else or anyone else? Um, I, I haven't used uh, PyAuto GUI in you know, Windows yet, but I use another tool called uh, AutoEd. I mean, oh, yeah. that's, that's pretty much a similar thing, and some there's like tons of script, uh, you know, people just create it online. Yeah, I, I know there's a, like a, I just Google around. There's a Python binding for that as well, but didn't get updated for two years. Yeah, so. that's, that's something similar I found with a with a lot of GUI automation tools because I mean this is a really handy thing just to be able to control the mouse and keyboard. Like if you're uh, there's some API, but it doesn't quite work as it's documented, or it's not documented at all, and you just want to toss up your hands and say whatever, I'll just program uh, the computer just automatically click on stuff. Um, so it's a really useful thing, but a lot of uh, tools that do GUI automation are out of date, or you know they're, they're only for Python 2, or they only work on Windows, or something like that, which is why I created this module to sort of be able to just work. Um, and uh, something else I was going to, oh yeah, so Auto IT uh, has a lot of great features. There's another. Uh, piece of software for Windows called uh, Auto Hotkey, which is really wonderful, except that they invented their own scripting language that you have to write in in order to use it, which kind of limits how, how great it is. Um, but yeah, I am accepting pull requests on GitHub for PyAuto GUI if you want to contribute. There's sort of a roadmap, um, mostly just looking at what Auto Hotkey does and say, that's really cool. I wish PyAuto GUI did that and then realizing I don't have a lot of time to actually follow up on that. Um, uh, another question is about a Selenium. Okay. Uh, could you just do the, I mean, uh, your script is script, uh, supporting the, like exporting of the Selenium script or whatever for low test or I mean, I mean, of course it's poor man's low test because for real one, you probably always go low runner, but that's $100,000, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, Selenium is its own standalone tool that has bindings for a lot of different languages, um, such as Python. So uh, Selenium actually has a lot of different features. Um, like if you want to test different browsers and different uh, at different resolutions, or you're constantly running these on like headless machines that don't have a monitor installed. Um, so I'm not sure how much of that functionality is exported to the Python binding for Selenium. But I'm, I'm assuming that it's a lot of it. I've kind of just barely scratched the surface. Um, but there, there's a very rich, uh, rich ecosystem around Selenium uh, that you can dive into. Uh, but for this talk, I just wanted to sort of give the 15-minute overview of that tool and show that it's you, know, you don't actually have to uh, read uh, too much on it to be able to start using it and getting some use out of it. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, can, uh, is PyAuto GUI used by digital artists in any way to do anything more complex than Well, you know, I mean, I just drew the there. spiral there, yeah. so I would like to assume I am a digital artist. Yeah. Um, Maybe outside the bounds I mean, of Microsoft Paint. So, uh, I, don't, I mean, if, 
if artists do use it, then they haven't told me. Uh, I think mostly it's just been used for like really simple uh, automated testing, or I don't know, if you've ever had like some really uh, some enterprise software with a terrible UI uh, where you you know when you log in you have to click on 20 checkboxes before then. People have told me they wrote like a quick script that'll just automatically click on all 20 of those checkboxes because they're tired of doing that every single morning when they come to work and log in. Um, so like really simple, tiny scripts like that, um, uh, people have told me they found PyAuto GUI to be really helpful doing that stuff. But as far as automatically using art, uh, like uh, automating artistic processes or whatever, uh, I know like uh, programs like Maya and other large pieces of uh, art software have APIs and other things that are really fancy. But um, you know, if the documentation is really poor or there's something else that you don't want to uh, do or like Photoshop uh, automated batch processing doesn't do something that you want to do. You can always write a script that'll just like, oh, well, click here, click here, click here, and then click here, and then just do that in a loop over and over again. I mean, but it has an application for that too. Do you have any uh, record and playback options using uh, PyAuto GUI? So far, no. Um, that's something that AutoHotKey does that would be really nice. It has some sort of feature where uh, you can just set it to record, and then it'll just record all the mouse clicks uh, that you do. Um, the major stumbling block for a feature like that is I want to have it on Windows, Mac, and Linux and have it working all the time. So just like I, I'd like to be able to set up um, some sort of like global hotkey register. Uh, registration. So if you press you know, control B or something like that, then uh, PyAuto GUI will be able to detect when that happens and uh, call some function or something like that. Um, but so far, there, uh, and once I have something like that, then it's probably related to being able to record stuff. So right now, the, the best thing I have is just that, what, import PyAuto GUI. How great this display mouse position thing that can just tell you where the mouse is, which is a tiny tool, and it's you know you have to basically write down something on paper or in a text file uh, where your x y coordinates are, um, and so unfortunately this isn't very sophisticated for for your workflow. Sure, thanks. Right, ideally that would be something that I want to add to to Pi out of GUI. Um, which would just streamline it so much. But uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I'm just wondering what was the origin story behind Automate the Boring Stuff? And uh, what did you originally intend uh, your, uh, the audience for this book to be? Oh, so um, I think it was like about 2012, maybe. Uh, well, this meme has always been out there of everyone should learn how to code. Uh, but. A few years ago, it really became very pronounced on Twitter and social media. Like everybody's kind of worrying about software eating the world, and so this meme of like everybody has to learn how to code. Um, yeah, and so I thought about that and thought, well, I mean, sure, that'd be great, uh, but not everybody has to become a software engineer. So, what if everybody could start uh, knew how to do some rudimentary programming? And I realized, you know. Well, there's a big use case with office workers or anybody with an office job and you're dealing with Excel spreadsheets all the time. Um, I had some friends who, who you know, would say, I spent four hours today opening a PDF, highlighting some bit of text, copying and pasting it into a spreadsheet, and then opening the next PDF and just doing that over and over again. Uh, and it's so the sort of thing where it's like, oh, well, if you knew how to program even just a little bit, you could write some script that could automatically do this. So I started generating a whole lot of, of use cases of like, well, what do people need to know coding uh, to do? Like, what's the actual practical application for that? Um, and so that's sort of where Automate the Boring Stuff with Python came in. I sort of thought, OK, what would office workers or hobbyists, people who want to learn to program, um, but, uh, and also, you know, but they're not necessarily going to become software engineers. So you know, it's OK if they use global variables everywhere for their small scripts or something like that. Um, and so yeah, I came up with a whole list of topics of like web scraping and GUI automation, but also just you know, updating Excel spreadsheets from a Python program, or parsing PDFs, or uh, parsing Word documents. And so the first half of this book is basically a generic Python tutorial. And then the second half just goes through all of these different Python modules that uh, many people have, have written. 
um, and just exploring like, oh, how can you do all of these practical tasks? Um, and it, it's worked out pretty well. Um, I get a lot of great feedback from it, and I decided to put it under a Creative Commons license. Uh, and so now it's also free to read uh, online as well. Oh, and also, right now there's, a, there's currently a Humble Bundle. Uh, if you go to humblebundle.com, you can get the ebook of this for a dollar, along with several other No Starch Press books. Um, so I think that goes on for, for another seven or eight days uh, if you just want to get a nicer PDF instead of just reading the HTML version of it. But yeah, that's basically where this book came from. Have you ever done any sweet pranks with uh, either of these tools? <laughs> what, are you a cop? <laughs> uh, no, not really. I was like, uh, that's sort of like what high school Al would do. But I mean, technically, I guess you could just have a script running in the background and, have, oh, <laughs> um, is this still recording? Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, so one thing I would do is when, you know, a friend of mine, when they worked from home, uh, but wanted their instant messenger to show that they were always active and on the computer um, because that, that sets you to idle like after five or ten minutes. So I just wrote a script that, you know, just every second or like every ten seconds just moves the mouse over by a pixel and then ten seconds later moves it back by a pixel just to, so that there's some activity uh, right there. This is what my uh, friend did. Um, <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, oh, OK. Uh, I guess that's it. So thank you very much.